Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabiyyihil kareem. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Omar Abdel Fattah. Um, and as the, the title suggests, uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm a, I'm a teacher and I'm the director of Ask Muslim Canada. And um, I did uh, a TEDx talk uh, by the name of Using Logic and Science to Establish Faith um, out of UBC. So let's begin. Um, first of all, hope you guys are all doing well. And Jazakumullah khair for taking the time to join us on this Sunday. Um, and this is a very, very important topic. So Jazakumullah khair for joining us. Uh, I want to remind myself first and foremost, uh, and all of you guys, to purify our intentions for the sake of Allah. Um, we're seeking knowledge, uh, uh, you know, in order to please Allah Azza wa Jal and to implement it and inshallah to teach it as well. So here we go. So our agenda for today is, um, for, we're going to start with an introduction and a disclaimer, uh, why this topic matters, Islamic evidence for these conditions, uh, treatment, how do you actually treat these conditions, uh, things to be aware of, followed by Q&A. Um, my presentation may not take actually that much time, uh, may or may not, um, uh, so maybe, maybe the Q&A will, will take up the bulk of the time, we'll see. Okay, so first of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, as, as, as a reminder, we purify our intention for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And uh, I would like to thank our sponsor, RHNA Accounting, who help us out tremendously. So may Allah reward Brother Akram, who's doing tremendous work. Uh, and, and yeah, so there are sponsors. So uh, shout out to them, alhamdulillah. Uh, myself, alhamdulillah, I am a certified hijama practitioner. Now that doesn't make me a raqi necessarily, uh, but um, this is definitely part of Islamic healing. Uh, I am trained and certified in uh, hijama. I don't, um, I don't necessarily, I'm not open to patients right now just because of my schedule. Uh, I'm not, I don't really have much time to, to actually do hijama on patients. Uh, but it is something I am trained, alhamdulillah, and, and certified in. Uh, I am a student of knowledge. I'm not a mufti. I'm not an Islamic scholar. Um, so that matters because sometimes some questions might come up that, you know, I just, I just have to say, I don't know. Uh, and then we have to refer it to a scholar. Okay. Um, my, one of my teachers. So how do I know about this topic? Um, one of my teachers is an experienced Iraqi, uh, Abu Abdullah, uh, in, out of Dubai. So my mother lives in Dubai. Uh, I, I learned from him uh, in Dubai, and he has actually he's uh, he's one of the, the lead Raqis at uh, Merkaz Tub Nabawi, which is basically the, the center for Islamic prophetic healing out of Dubai. And they see uh, 3000 patients. They serve 3000 uh, patients a day. So subhanAllah, it, it um, uh, and we're going to talk about this, but you're going to see that this is something that affects a lot of people. This is something that affects a lot of people. And, um, and it needs to be discussed, okay? Now, I'm assuming you guys can hear me well. Please, if at any, time, uh, if at any point um, um, you can't see me, you can't hear me, please just let me know. And um, a note about fear. So we are gonna be talking about jinn possession, magic, evil eye. And for some people, some people don't even believe in these things, which we're gonna address. And some people are really scared of these things. So for example, like jinn possession, is that even real? And oh my God, what if you saw somebody who, uh, who was affected by jinn, what do you do? Um, uh, you know, what's it like? Yes, so, so yes, there is an element of fear, but as Muslims, we shouldn't be scared of these things. We should not be scared of these things. Why? Because the jinn are a creation of Allah. They're a creation of Allah. And some of them are righteous and some of them are not righteous. So the jinn are a creation of Allah. It's just like seeing a bug on the, on the floor or, you know, like an ant or a snake. Yeah, some animals are scarier than others. But it is often the case where the jinn can actually be more scared of the raqi than the raqi of the jinn. And, and so we'll, we'll discuss this. But basically what I'm trying to say is uh, I don't want people to be scared. As Muslims, we should only fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And we make dua that Allah makes us people who only fear him and nothing else. Allahumma amin. Okay. Now, why does this topic, why, is, why does this discussion even matter? Number one, many of, our, many of our brothers and sisters suffer from these conditions in silence. So many of our brothers and sisters suffer from these conditions, no doubt. I mean, I, mean, I know of cases here in, in the Lower Mainland. Um, uh, you know, this is something that is well known. 
um, and uh, and people are suffering. Whether it's magic, evil eye, uh, jinn possession, people suffer. So we need to discuss this. We need to discuss this. And honestly, this is just kind of the beginning. But I think there should be regular halakas about these things. Number two, sometimes these things are rejected, neglected, slash misdiagnosed as mental health issues. Okay. So some people, as we've said, they don't even believe in jinn possession, which is foolish if you're a Muslim uh, or if you're anybody, because even non-Muslims believe in jinn possession. Um, so they just reject it. They say, no, this person's just crazy. There's something, a mental health issue. Um, sometimes they know, they believe something's there, but people don't take care of it. They, they don't actually try to address the issue. And sometimes um, a person has jinn, but it's actually diagnosed as, for example, schizophrenia or bipo uh, bipolar disorder. Or, or something else. So uh, this is something that is, it's, it's a really a deep field. Um, and it, 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 like people who do Ruqya, I mean, I've met Raqis that their entire profession, their entire life is in Ruqya. So it's not like these guys, you know, they work a full-time job and then they do Ruqya. No, it's like they're full-time Raqis. And they, they really uh, delve deep into this field. And there's a lot of knowledge to be known. And one thing that will come up is, you know, you can't get all of your knowledge and experience of Ruqya from the Quran and Sunnah. You can't, because a lot of this stuff is a knowledge of the unseen and it's experiential knowledge, right? Yes, of course, we use the Quran and Sunnah, but the Quran and Sunnah doesn't lay out every single detail about the, about the field of Ruqya, right? Uh, in the same way that the Quran and Sunnah might not lay out every single thing about Newton's, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, the, the law of, uh, of gravity, for example, right? So, um, so th that needs to be said, but we're going to discuss that, inshallah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Is jinn possession real? So first, first thing, and I just want to clarify, clarify what I mean by this. What I mean is essentially we are using the Quran and Sunnah, but what I'm saying is some of the knowledge that Raqis are exposed to is not something that's explicitly mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. I just want to make that clear, right? Because it's a very deep field and people learn by doing Ruqya, right? And by seeing different cases, okay? That's what I mean by that. Now, is jinn possession real? Yes. What is the evidence for this? Okay, from the Quran, first and foremost, A'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Al-ladheena ya'kuluna al-riba la yaqoomuna illa kama yaqoomu al-ladhi yatakhabbatuhu al-shaytan min al-mas. Those who devour or eat riba will not stand on the day of resurrection except like the standing of a person beaten by shaytan, leading him to insanity. And specifically the word, um, mess. mess means the affliction of a shaitan, jinn possession. Okay, so the word mess is used um, uh, for, for, for in this case, and mess is commonly referred to as jinn possession. Okay, so this is one of the clear evidences from the, from the Quran that jinn possession exists. Scholarly consensus there's, there's ijma on the fact that jinn possession exists. And I want to make something very clear. Non-Muslims also believe in jinn possession. Virtually every religion, from what I understand, believes that spirits or something can actually possess an individual, okay? They might refer to it as spirits or something else, right? Christians and Jews refer to it as, uh, they refer to it as devils, right? We, we refer to it as jinn because sometimes actually, believe it or not, sometimes a believing jinn can actually possess somebody. Sometimes a Muslim jinn can possess somebody. And there's different ways of dealing with that. So um, regarding this, um, as I've said, many religions, many religions believe in this. Many religions believe in this. And, and I want to say, so uh, general questions, we'll leave them to the end. If you have any, anything that's unclear, please just ask me right away. So if, if anything's unclear, didn't make sense, please just, uh, just interrupt me, put your hand up, or you could just comment or just, just unmute yourself and just ask me, so, sorry, what did you mean by that? So just to make sure that you guys are following along. So scholarly consensus plus observable cases, and you have evidence from the Sunnah. So basically, indeed, shaitan flows through Adam like blood flows, right? Okay. So uh, Satan flows through the blood of Adam, flows through Adam like human beings as as blood flows. Okay. So this is something that is mentioned in the Sunnah. So based off this, yes, we believe in jinn possession. And there is no doubt about it. Okay, <laughs> clear. That, okay, now magic is magic real? Yes. And there are there's so much evidence from the Quran and Sunnah regarding magic. 
One of them is uh, verse 102 in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ So clearly it mentions that they taught the people magic. This is about the, the angels in Babylon at the time of Solomon, how there were people basically, uh, people who were learning magic. And the angels would teach them this and they'd say, we are a trial for you, do not disbelieve. Okay? So uh, this is clearly mentioned that it is magic. And uh, the word sahar is also mentioned in the Quran. They, they say, for example, how, how they called Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a sahar, a magician. When Musa alayhi salam, uh, he met the, the magicians at the time of Pharaoh, right? Qala Musa majitum bihi sihr. Musa said, what you came with is magic. What you came with is magic. So magic is something that is mentioned clearly in the Quran, clearly. And in the Sunnah as well, because it affected Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. Many people don't realize, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he himself was aff afflicted by magic. And what is the evidence for this? This is in Bukhari, an Aisha, an Aisha radiallahu anha, qalat suhira nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hatta kana yukhayiru ilayhi annahu yaf'alu al-shay' yaf'alu yaf'alu al-shay' wa ma yaf'aluhu. So here the words are suhira nabiyu. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was afflicted with magic. And what did this magic do to him? It made him think that he did something, but he didn't do it, right? So, so maybe he, you know, it made him think that he did something, but he didn't do it. And this happened regarding his wives, right? So did he spend time with one wife or did he not, okay? So it made him think that he did something, but he did not do it. Now, and it is mentioned, I learned from another source that, that actually the, the magic that was done on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was actually intended to kill him. So subhanAllah, but because he was a prophet sallallahu alayhi wa it didn't have that effect on him. It couldn't kill him. It had a much lesser effect and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. But the point is here that magic is clearly something that is established in the Quran and Sunnah. There's no doubt about it. And people, and we're going to discuss this, but there are magicians in and around us. I'm telling you straight up, there are magicians who might appear as Muslim, who might call themselves Muslim, all right, or non-Muslim, but there are magicians around us okay and and i'm not you, you're gonna see what i mean and people who know me know I, I i i don't lie even when i'm joking i try not to exaggerate uh and you're gonna see you're gonna see what i mean inshallah now is the evil eye real evil eye is also very real the evil eye is real now what is the evil eye the evil eye is when you look at someone um out of like amazement and then you cause it um it's like an eye of envy and you cause that person to lose that thing Okay, you cause that person to lose that thing. An example is, and this, this is a story I heard from someone, subhanAllah. It was a sister, and she was wearing, uh, she was wearing a very nice, I think it was a very nice watch. Okay, and she attended a meeting. And the people at the meeting, yes, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan, absolutely. The people who attended the meeting, they kept, they looked at her like, oh, like they, they looked at her and, and they were also looking at her hand. Like, like, I don't know, apparently she had like really nice hands or something. I don't know. But um, so they were looking at her and they looked at her hand. And subhanAllah, this is, what, this is what the sister actually told me. Within a number of hours, we're not talking days, within like three or four hours, she ended up getting into a car accident. And the only thing that was affected was her hand. The only thing that was affected was her hand. And I didn't mention it this, but there's also a story in, in the Sunnah how there was a Sahabi bathing and another Sahabi walked by and he was amazed by the beauty of, of this person's body. And because of the evil eye, the person literally dropped into the water and they brought him before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he explained to them the situation and what to do. So the evil eye is mentioned clearly in the, uh, in the Sunnah and even in the, in the Quran. Like for example, uh, in the last two verses of Surah Al-Qalam, وَإِن يَكَادُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا يُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ لَمَّا سَمِعُوا الذِّكْرَ وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّهُ لَمَجْنُونَ Okay, so how, how basically Allah talks about how the, 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 the disbelievers, they, they intended to like, okay, so the exact translation slips my mind, but the, 
but they with their eyes, with their eyes, with another, be absari him, with their eyes, right? They would have intended to basically do something negative to Prophet Muhammad. They almost did something negative to Prophet Muhammad with their eyes. Okay, and then uh, other ayahs like women sharri hasidin idha hasad from the evil of the envier when he envies. But a very clear evidence from the Sunnah is this. An Ibn Abbas, An Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, uh, radiallahu anhu ma, al ainu haq, walau kana shayun sabak al qadar, sabakatu al ain. Okay, the influence of the evil eye is a fact. This is a Sahih hadith. And if anything would precede destiny, it would be the influence of an evil eye. If anything were to precede the decree of Allah, it would have been the evil eye. But nothing precedes the, the decree of Allah. But it shows you this is how powerful the evil eye is. Okay? And when you are asked to take a bath as a cure from the influence of an evil eye, you should take a bath. And we're going to talk about that. One of the ways to, uh, uh, to cure the evil eye is to go to the person whom you think gave it to you. And there's ways to do this, right? Uh, and then you ask them for uh, wudu water. There will do water and then you bathe with it, okay? So let's continue, inshallah. How do we understand these calamities, first of all? So somebody might ask, okay, like why, why do these happen? Um, how do we understand these calamities? And this goes back to a very important topic, which I'm not going to spend too much time on because we can dedicate a whole halakha to this. But Allah created this life as a test. The one who created death and life to test which of you is best in deeds. And Allah says in the Quran very clearly, Every soul shall taste death and we will test you and we will test you with evil and good evil and good and to us is your return and we will test you with evil things and good things and to us is your return so these calamities depending on now now it depends on how a person responds to them but these may very well be a test. These may very well be a test. And we need to remember that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself was afflicted with magic. And he is better than you and I. And he himself was afflicted with magic. So subhanAllah. Um, so this shows you that uh, these things need to be understood in the correct way as well. Right? We don't just say, now, can it be a punishment? Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Okay. Can it be a punishment depending on who gets it, how it's done, etc.? Allah knows best. But for the believer who responds to it in a good way, can it be a test? Absolutely. And the hadith says when, when uh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was asked, Ayyu nasi ashaddu bala'an? Which people are the most severely tried? Qala al-anbiya thumma al-amthalu fal-amthalu. Okay. And then he goes on to say, Yubtal al ala hasabi deen. Okay. So basically, uh, the people who are most severely tried are the prophets, and then those nearest to them, and those nearest to them. And a person is tried according to their, their level of faith. A, a person is tried according to their level of faith. So the, the stronger their faith is, the more severely they are tried. And the less, the less uh, their faith is, the less they are tried. Okay? So now I'm going to, any questions up until now in terms of clarifying anything? Does anybody have any questions up until now? Okay, um, excellent questions. I'll answer those. Um, I'll answer because they're more general questions. I'll answer them at the end, inshallah. That's okay. But please, please stay because these are very, very important questions. Okay, how do we diagnose these conditions? So 
somebody says, you know, what, I think I might be affected by gin. I think I might be affected by uh, by magic uh, or whatever it is. Um, okay, excellent questions. Now, I'm gonna just list these three and we'll discuss them. First of all, first of all, for all these three conditions, okay, for all these three conditions, what Rocky say should be done. What Rocky should be say what's uh, what Rocky say should be done is this. A person, for example, um, okay, let's. I, I heard of this case, for example. A person, um, they are affected by jinn, and a person can no longer like uh, open their eyes when it comes to reading the Quran. Okay, literally, they they you open a mushaf in front of them, they cannot open their eyes. They cannot. Now. Before we, before we, you know, say, okay, you have jinn or magic or evil eye, what Rockies say is a person should go and get their medical test, their psychological test done. I'm going to say that again, very important. Before we start, you know, administering, well, not necessarily before Rokia, but before we determine is this jinn, is it something else, is it something else? Rockies recommend, Rockies recommend that, and not only recommend, but I know one of them who demands, <laughs> Um, he demands that basically you you go and you get checked. You go and you get checked um, medically, psychologically to make sure you've, you've, you've basically checked, tech, uh, you know, ticked off the box. So it's not, for example, bipolar disease. It's not schizophrenia. It's not this, this, this. Okay. And the right thing to do if somebody thinks that they're affected by uh, gin, evil eye or magic is to make sure and it's affecting you in a health way, in some way in your health, go and get the medical test done. And often what may happen, if a person truly has these cases, the doctors will not know what's going, what's wrong with them. The doctors will not know what's going on and they will not know what's wrong with them. They say, well, you know what? You seem perfectly healthy. All your tests came back negative. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't know what's wrong with you. Now, if the person still has issues and all their medical tests came back negative, then chances are it could be that this is uh, one of these three. One of these three. Okay, so again, it's important to get the medical and psychological diagnoses done first before seeing a rocky. Okay, number one, gin possession. The easiest way, the easiest way to diagnose gin possession, easiest way is by reading the Quran on someone. Reading the Quran on someone. Or even better, getting the person themselves to read the Quran. Okay. So what does that mean? Okay, so let's say, for example, somebody thinks they're affected by jinn. And, um, and okay, if they came to me, I would say, okay, read the Quran. And they start reading Surah Al-Fatiha. I would say, read, read not just any part of the Quran. I would say, read Surah Al-Fatiha, read the Quls, read Ayat Al-Kursi. Somebody who's affected by jinn, eventually they're not going to be able to read. Eventually they're not going to be able to read and they're going to react negatively. Some people might start shaking. Some people might start screaming. Some people might, might pass out. Some people might, might do different things. So this is the easiest way to diagnose jinn possession. Read the Quran or have them read it. And if there is a negative reaction, then this could be jinn. This could be jinn. Okay. Evil eye. How do you diagnose evil eye? Evil eye, you get the person to tell you their story. You get the person to tell you their story. So they might say, okay. Uh, brother, I was, uh, you know, everything was going well. I was doing really well in school. And then, you know, or I was, you know, I was doing well at work. And then I got this promotion. And then I noticed this one employee was giving me a really like, he started giving me a cold shoulder. And he started like, you know, uh, when I would say salam, he wouldn't return the salam. Or, you know, he would, uh, you know, I, I would do things. He'd always try to avoid me. And he was always giving me like a, like a, like a, evil, like literally he would always look at me like this or something like that. Now, if they tell you their story, usually their story can kind of, hint at whether they have evil eye or not. It can highlight whether or not they have evil eye or not. Depending on their story, if there's usually an instance or somebody specifically who they think gave them the evil eye and things started going sour, this very well could be the evil eye. And the evil eye, as we said, right? The Prophet said, the evil eye, its effect is real. Okay, its effect is real. Okay? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm going to inshallah go back to that. Um, uh, I'm going to inshallah go back to that okay. uh, towards the end, because I know there's going to be probably a lot of questions. So, so inshallah, we'll discuss them towards the end. Now, that's evil eye. So you look at the, the person's story. And also sometimes when you, you recite the Quran on somebody who has evil eye, 
um, they also react negatively to the Quran. They may also react negatively to the Quran, especially, and I've heard Rocky is doing this and Allah knows best, um, especially when you recite, for example, um, you, you might recite specific uh, verses, okay? Like for example, like some 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 Rockies might say Ainun Jariya, Ainun Jariya. They might repeat the word Ain, even though in this case it has a different meaning. Okay, uh, they repeat the word Ain, and then the person starts reacting. Okay, if somebody has the evil eye. Okay, and again, you guys, some people just don't believe this, but but this is this is what Araki sees almost every day. Okay, this is what Araki sees, and my my teacher, he's seen all of these, all of these. Okay. Um, so anyways, um, magic, magic. Now, how do you determine if a person has magic? Usually there's some sort of effect, something happening in the person's life. So for example, a common, okay. Magic can be done, for example, and so it mentioned in the Quran, um, to separate between a husband and wife, to separate between a husband and wife. Okay. Okay. So the people of Babylon, they used to learn, they used to learn basically what used to basically cause separation between husband and wife. It's mentioned in the Quran. Okay. It used to cause separation between husband and wife. So for example, if everything was going well, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, for example, the spouses are arguing all the time. And what's also common in this field is that spouses may not actually um, share bed with each other. Okay. They might, they might go months or years without, without ever going, like touching each other, okay? <clears throat> and this is a sign. It doesn't always mean that it's magic, but this is a sign that it could be, could mean magic. It could be magic. And the way to diagnose it again is with the Quran. Somebody, depending on the case, you may start reciting Quran on somebody and they may start reacting. They might start reacting neg negatively if they've had sihr done on them, if they've had magic done on them. So the Quran in many ways is a, is a diagnostic tool. The Quran is a diagnostic tool. People should never react negatively to the Quran. Yes, sometimes you get bored, you get sleepy. That doesn't mean you're affected by jinn or any of these things. But if somebody starts getting very angry or starts shaking or blanking out or, or, or whatever it may be, um, that could be one of these things. It could be one of these things, okay? <clears throat> and sometimes as we said with jinn possession, the jinn actually speaks on the tongue of the human being. The jinn speaks on the tongue of the human being. So the, the person is physically there, but it's not them. It's not their voice. Um, uh, it's not their voice. And so it's a different, it's a different uh, creation of Allah speaking. Okay. So how do we treat these conditions? How do we treat these conditions? I'm going to first highlight some general rules. Very first and foremost, my dear brothers and sisters, I cannot emphasize this enough. And, and you know, it's the only bolded point. You have to correct your aqidah. You have to correct your belief in Allah Azza wa Okay? Because the Quran is shifa'un lima fi sudur. Right? And it's shifa'un uh, and rahmah for people who believe. It's for believers. The Quran is shifa, as Allah says, for people who are believers. They call me yu'minun, for people who believe. So number one, you have to correct your aqidah. If you are afflicted with any of these things, you have to say, Ya Allah, this only happened by your will. As Allah himself says in the Quran, وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ In verse 102 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, they do not cause any harm to anyone except by the will of Allah. Illa bi idhnillah. So number one, we have to correct our aqidah and realize this happened by the will of Allah. Allah is able to remove it at any time. Right? And he is the shafi. He is the one who cures. And this is, you know, I, I say this, but this is extremely important because sometimes people come to the raqi and they say, Ya raqi, please help me, cure me, cure me. The Raqi cannot cure you. The Raqi cannot cure you. I'm going to say that again. The Raqi cannot cure you, brothers and sisters. The Raqi can only give you advice, nasiha, read Quran on you. He cannot cure you. So this should be your understanding. You have to realize Allah is the only one who can cure. 
Allah is the only one who can cure. If you don't have that understanding, then, then you, we need to go back to square one. We need to go back to square one. And, and this, this, this one point here, and, and I'm going to mention this because it's very important. This one point here can actually make your condition worse. What do I mean by that? Because sometimes what happens is people with incorrect aqidas, they go to these batal raqis. Now in this field, raqi means somebody who does ruqya. Brothers and sisters, in this field, in this field, I want to say, I want to say a significant number, if not majority. I don't want to say majority. Let's say a significant number of people who do ruqya, they do ruqya on the batil and or they themselves are magicians. I am telling you the people that, that people go to when they're sick, they might be going themselves to a magician. And I'm going to tell you, how do you know if somebody is a magician or not? Okay. So if you're going to go to someone, and I've literally heard of people going and they say, for example, uh, you need to go, you need to slaughter this chicken. Uh, and you, do, you need to do it at a certain time when the sun is rising or, 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 or do, you know, weird, weird things. Weird things. We don't slaughter other than in the name of Allah. So I'm not, I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but that's why, inshallah, I want to leave the, the Q&A open. So we'll go through this, and inshallah, we'll, we'll go to the Q&A. Um, make dua, Allahumma shfini. Right? Allahumma shfini. Oh, Allah, uh, grant me shifa. Make dua, and if you can, get up and pray to Hajjud. I know now it's hard because, you know, uh, depending on your sleep schedule, Aisha is late and Fajr is early. But if you're able to, get up 15 minutes, pray two rakahs. Uh, before Fajr comes in and say, oh Allah, cure me. And there are specific du'as from the sunnah uh, that a person can say. Okay, and we will highlight, inshallah, at least, at least one of them later on. Now, if, if it is evil eye, you ask for wudu water. Okay? Now, the hadith itself mentions, if we go back to it, it says that if you're asked to give wudu water, then you give it. Okay? So what does this mean? Let's say, for example, you were at a gathering. Okay, because some people can be very offended if you ask them for wudu water. Hey, I gave you, uh, you gave me evil eye, give me your wudu, right? So you don't do it like that, right? You have to do it in a, in a way with wisdom. Uh, yes, uh, it is being recorded. You'll have a recording later on. So, um, uh, so you have to do it with wisdom. So you go to, here's, here's an example that I've heard, okay? From somebody who actually does rukia. Let's say, for example, you're at a gathering in the masjid and you know who was there. Let's say there were, you know, six, seven people, for example. Could have been more, could have been less. <coughs> and um, after that day, you started, you know things went south. And sometimes with evil eye, you can literally see a sign on someone's face. And this is mentioned in a hadith, right? Um, how sometimes the evil eye, you can literally see signs of the evil eye on someone's face. You know that they've been affected by evil eye. Now, if, so let's say you go to these five, six brothers, you know, after this time that you were with them, things started going sour. They started going south. So you would go to the brothers and you say, brothers, uh, you know, please forgive me. I don't want to offend any of you. But, but since that last time we were here, you know, I, um, I felt like something was really affecting me. And I'm not, I'm not accusing you, any of you brothers, for giving me ayin. But I would just ask if you could, for the sake of Allah, if you could just make your wudu water so I can just, uh, if you can make wudu, if I could have your water so I could purify myself with it. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. Um, one thing that scholars say, another thing that a person can do now, if you know that a person's going to react, if you know, for example, who did it, let's say it's not a group of people, you know, it's one person, but you know, if you went up to them, it could make things a lot worse. And, you know, some people you just can't ask wudu order for, for example, I would still say, try to do it. And if they don't, that's between them and Allah. Okay. Now they may not do it. It may lead to more problems. If you think it's going to lead to more problems, I would say consult a scholar first and see what they say. If you think it's going to lead to more problems, you know, consult a scholar first and see what they say. One thing that is mentioned, one thing that is mentioned, and this is not something that's mentioned in the, uh, in the sunnah, but it is something that is tried, it's uh, mujarrab, something that is tried, is let's say, for example, the person won't give you their, their wudu water. You tried and they won't give it to you. So another thing you do is, let's say you're, you're for example, at a gathering, you would take, and I know with COVID, this seems kind of like people would do this necessarily right now, but... Um, you would go and take their utensils. They were at a gathering. You take their plate, spoon, fork, whatever. You would dip it into water and you would take a bath with that. Okay. And that is in a case of somebody who doesn't give you their wudu water. And this has been tried and it has been proven successful. This has been tried and it has been proven successful. Okay. 
Now, if evil eye and can get wudu water, then you do ruqya. If you can't do either of that, then you do ruqya, and we're going to talk about what exactly you read afterwards. Okay? And ruqya means reciting Quran, Sunnah, uh, and doesn't just have to be Quran and Sunnah, but, but we'll discuss that, inshallah. Now, if magic and you know where it is, then the magic should be destroyed. If magic and you know where it is, then the magic should be destroyed. And there are ways to destroy magic, but for the sake of not, you know, I don't want to, you could do a whole session on just how to destroy magic. So what I would say is if you actually know where the magic is, then consult a trusted scholar and, and, and seek their advice regarding how to destroy it. Okay. If magic and don't know where it is, do ruqya. Okay. And we're going to talk about what exactly to read. If jinn possession, you do ruqya. You do ruqya. Now, something I want to I want to say regarding these three conditions. I'm just going to go back here. Now, these three conditions. Sometimes, okay. So, first of all, sometimes the the evil eye can be associated with a jinn. So, what I'm trying to say is, sometimes a person can have evil eye and jinn possession. A person could have magic and jinn possession, and the and the jinn can be associated with the magic. Okay. The jinn can be associated with the magic. And sometimes a person can only have jinn possession and not evil eye and magic. And sometimes, you know, people even say that a jinn can give somebody evil eye. Okay? A jinn can give somebody evil eye. Okay? So, again, this is a, a, this is a, a very, very detailed field. And, um, and I'm just highlighting this because sometimes these factors can be associated with each other. So, somebody could, could get an evil eye that is so severe that it's associated or it's attached to a jinn and the jinn affects the person. So he becomes like a servant of the evil eye. The jinn becomes a servant of the evil eye, okay? And one thing I learned from my teacher, one thing I learned from my teacher is that we shouldn't be so boggled, we shouldn't be so, so concerned with identifying is it jinn possession, is it evil eyes or magic? Right? We shouldn't be, well, I need to know. I need to know with precision. Is it evil eye? Is it magic? Is it possession? You may never know. All of this is knowledge of the unseen. All of this is knowledge of the unseen. And, and sihr literally means something which is hidden. Sihr means something which is hidden. So we see the effect, but we don't see the cause of it. Right? Like, for example, a magician levitates. How do they do that? The jinn's helping them. Right? We don't see the jinn, but we see the effect of the levitation. Person rising up. Right? So my point is, sometimes we don't need to be, and not sometimes, but we shouldn't be so focused on, is it jinn, is it evil eyes and magic? The cure is the same. The cure, generally speaking, right? Well, except for those things that I mentioned about doing wudu water and stuff like that. Um, uh, but the Quran is the cure. Not the Quran is the cure, but the Quran is the means by which Allah may grant shifa if he wills. Right? And he says that the Quran is shifa. Okay? So that's something we need to understand. Okay. Is it magic always associated with jinn? Uh, not necessarily, no. Sometimes the magic can just have, uh, and I'm going to inshallah go to these questions uh, at the end, but sometimes the magic can just have like an effect on someone. For example, where a husband doesn't approach um, a husband. Now, I have to be careful because, yes, so when somebody is doing magic, then yes, they're using jinn usually. Yes, they are, right? But sometimes what, what I mean is that the jinn may not be very obvious. Okay, sometimes the jinn is very obvious. It can literally affect the person and speak on their tongue. But sometimes uh, uh, the, the effect of the jinn is not obvious. But you're right that, that it is always associated with, with jinn because how is magic done? Usually using jinn. Okay? And we're going to talk about, you know, uh, what exactly, how, how these magicians use the jinn and what they have to do to use the jinn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that clarifies that. Okay. Now, how do we treat these conditions? We said these things. If jinn possession ruqya, always, always correct your intention. When you are reading the Quran on someone, you don't, um, you don't think, okay, well, me reading the Quran right now is going to cure them person. No, it's Allah who cures, and the, Quran, and the Quran is a means by which Allah cures. Okay, It's like, for example, Tylenol, or a, a, a better example is like uh, people who have cancer. Um, you know, they take, uh, they, do, they undergo chemotherapy, and, you know, the chemotherapy itself is not the shifa because sometimes it doesn't the, the pills themselves sometimes don't cure the person right the shifa is by the will of allah allah puts shifa in certain things and we are encouraged to seek shifa but these things are not the shafi these are not the, the things that cause the the cure 
right? It's Allah Azza wa Jal who puts the cure in these things. This is the correct aqidah, the correct understanding to have in somebody who is sick, okay? Now, what do I read? Do general rules, some general rules, okay? What you do must not contain shirk or kufr, obviously. Now, I say this, but I need to be, I need to emphasize this a lot. Many of the people that, many of the, um, many of the Iraqis that people go to, they themselves use jinn and they themselves might be magicians. Many of the Iraqis that people go to, they themselves might be magicians and they themselves might do, might be doing shirk or kufr. Now, what, oh, Brother Omar, how can you say that? Okay. My teacher, he has over 15 years of experience and he's traveled the world. Okay. And, and he's traveled and he's been to places like Pakistan and other places. And, and he basically tells me this is, he, he's seen it all. He's done it all. He's tried it and he's seen it. Okay. And what happens sometimes is a person goes to a, a magician, a person goes to a Rocky and then the magician or the Rocky, sorry. And sometimes they are the same. The Rocky says before even speaking about the person, before even looking at their case, the Rocky says, what is your mother's maiden name? And you, some of you might be shocked. Some of what? Yes, they say, what is your mother's maiden name? What's your mother's last name? Before they even, you know, analyze your situation, before they ask you, when did it happen? What, what are the symptoms? They say, what is your mother's maiden name? If somebody asks you this, this person is working with Jim. If somebody asks you this, straight up, this person is working with Jim. Okay? Now, is it permissible to use Jim and Rukia? Is it not? This is where there are, and, and, and there are different opinions here. I will say there are. I personally don't go with the opinion that it's allowed, but I will say this. I will say this. The scholars who say, you know, if you go to a, a Maulana and he says, yeah, well, I have jinn. I have an army of jinn that helped me. They're Muslim jinn. Okay. The question we have to ask is, number one, how do you know that they are Muslim jinn? Do you see them praying the Salah in the Masjid? Do you see them giving zakat? Do you see them fasting? Do you see them praying taraweeh? We have no way of validating if jinn are Muslim or not. They could say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. They say it. But there's no way of us knowing. There's no way of us. Um, there's no way of us knowing whether they're believing jinn or not. And, and you know the hadith, there's a hadith of um, Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. How Iblis basically, or Shaitan, deceived him three times when he was guarding the, the, the Baytul Mal, when he was guarding the, the treasures of the Muslims. And the Shaitan came to him and, and you know, he caught, Abu Huraira caught the Shaitan stealing from the wealth of the Muslims. And then the Shaitan was saying, uh, oh, please, I have a big family, I need to feed them, blah, blah, blah. So out of the softness of, her, of his heart, he let him go. Okay. And then it happened again, second time. And then it happened a third time. And then, the fourth time, the shaitan uh, actually told him, I'm going to tell you something. I'll let you go. Uh, he is saying, what if I told you something that will benefit you? And then the shaitan, to uh, the shaitan told him about reciting ayat of kursi, reading it at night, and how it's a protection for you from the shaitan. And then when he went to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, he has, he has told you the truth about the ayat of kursi, and he is a liar, though he is a liar. So the shaitan is a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a gharoor, right? Gharoor, sorry, he's a gharoor. He's somebody who, he's somebody who deceives people. So these Rockies say, well, yeah, I have, I have believing jinn who work with me and they help me and they do this. They do this for the sake of Allah. How do you know they're believing jinn? And what are you doing? What are you doing to get these jinn to work for you? And the one opinion that I heard is, you know, how, how, uh, and I heard this from a respected scholar, so I'm not gonna, I'm not attacking the scholar, or you know, I'm not disrespecting the scholar. But he said, you know, a person who, uh, you know, the, the, the person who get these jinn, they have such a high level of iman, such high taqwa. So my question is, do these people have more, you know, taqwa and iman than the Sahaba, than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? They had these conditions at their time, and they never used jinn. So why are these what you call raqis, as they say, using jinn? And then the last question we have to ask is what are they doing to get these jinn to work for them all the time? Because brothers and sisters, like I can't go to brother Adnan, for example, who's here, say, brother Adnan, you know, I need a, I need a personal assistant to stay with me. 
every day from nine to nine, who, you, you're going to help me with, with whatever it is, Akhi. Whatever it is I ask you, you're going to help me all for the sake of Allah. But Brother Adnan, he has, he has a family to feed. He has, you know, he has to pay the bills. He has his own things to worry about. So what is Brother Adnan getting in return for helping me? Of course, we all help, you know, we, we all do things for the sake of Allah, but other things to take care of. So the question is, what are these Iraqis doing to keep this army of jinn, as they say, under their authority? So these are things we need to, these are things we need to ask. So when I say must not contain shirk or kafir, and this will come up later, so we'll get into it later on, but this is one of the obvious things. If, if Iraqi says, go slaughter this thing in the name of, uh, say like, uh, in the name of Iblis or something else. Obviously, you don't do that. Araki might say, and I've actually heard this. He might say, okay, well, you need to do this. You need to go and, um, and, and I'm going to give you some water and you're going to go and do this and you're going to go put it under the stars at night. And then you're going to do something, you're going to sleep under it and you're going to do all the like, weird things. And you ask, well, why are we doing that? Why? And the reality is, my brothers and sisters, many of these jinns, they worship the stars. They worship the stars. So if a Rocky tells you to do something with stars, be very careful. Be very, very careful. Okay. Now, remove images and dogs from your home. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yadkhulu al-malaika tu baytan fihi kalbun wa la surah. Angels do not enter a house in which there is a dog or an image. And actually, Mufti Mink has this video online. You guys can all see this. But he said one time Mufti Mink was doing a ruqya and, and he said, the effect of the ruqya was actually less because the person had images in their house. And what do we mean by images? We mean images of animate beings. Like you have a picture of your, of your, your grandparents on the wall, like hung up, like large. Okay? So that kind of thing. Angels do not enter a house in which there is an image or a dog. Okay? Personally, I don't keep any images in my house. Other than, you know, kids' toys for my daughters. Right? I try to avoid images as much as I can. And kids' toys are a different ruling in Islam. Okay, so um, images in your house, I would say remove images. If you have a dog in your home, remove them because you want the angels of Rahma, of mercy, to enter your house. Okay, uh, bed sheets, uh, uh, more detailed questions like that. Basically, what scholars say is if something is like disrespected, like, a, like something like a, I don't know, like a carpet has an image on the, of a face uh, or something like a curtain, right? Uh, then that's fine. Then they say that's fine, right? Um, uh, I, and Allah says, you know, fear him as much as you're able to do. Um, cartoon bed sheet, I would say, I mean, you're sleeping on it. It is something that's kind of, I mean, especially for kids, I mean, kids urinate on it, right? So um, it's not something that's very, you know, it's not a very respected thing, like something, a, a picture on the wall. But I would say if you're able to avoid it, if it's not too difficult, then, then, then perhaps it's best to avoid it. And Allah knows best. So remove images and dogs from your house. Because again, angels are prevented from entering the uh the house and don't, don't tell me oh well, my house i read surah al-baqarah and all these things you may but angel jibreel alayhi salam did not enter angel jibreel alayhi salam did not enter the house of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam because he had image because he had an image in his house so if he if jibreel is not entering the house of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam then don't tell me these other angels are going to be entering your house okay <laughs> when we have clear evidence from the quran and sunnah regarding this issue uh, it's best to read on yourself. If you're able to read on yourself, read on yourself. Okay? Because, uh, you know, the hadith about the 70,000 who enter uh, Jannah bi ghayri hisab, uh, uh, one of the conditions, that one of the things that they did is they didn't ask for ruqya. They didn't ask for it. Okay? So, so read on yourself. Now, sometimes a person's in a case where they cannot read themselves. And this, this is different. This is different. Somebody offers, you say, you need help. I'll, I'll read on you. No problem with that whatsoever. Okay, but if you're able to read on yourself, read on yourself. Okay, if reading on someone else, read close to the right ear. So this is something I've heard more than once. If you're going to read on somebody who's affected by jinn, magic, evil eye, whatever it may be, read close to their right ear, as close you can to the right ear as possible. Okay, and one of the other things that is is also I learned from my teacher is you, for example, when somebody's when you're reading on someone, you gently tap them. Right, like for example, like like this. Like for example, I'm reading on someone. I gently tap them like this, almost like you're burping a baby. You know how you burp a baby, a baby. <laughs> you just tap them like this. Not like you don't like pound their chest, but like you tap them. Okay, because this is gonna come up as well. Okay, 
Never ever hurt the patient. Never hurt the patient. Never hurt the patient. And I say that three times because sometimes people go to Rockies who are using uh, you know, whips and, and literally trying to beat the shaitan out of someone. The hadith says, la darara wa la dirar. There is no inflicting harm upon yourself and no reciprocating harm between others, between yourself and others. So never hurt the patient. I've, like, I've heard of people even using razor blades. Like this is their ignorance. They use laser blades because they say, oh, the shaitan says he's right here. The shaitan says he's right here. So I'm going to just cause a little cut here so the shaitan can come out. Did the shaitan wait for you to get a little uh, booby scratch on your arm so they can enter? No, they didn't. So you don't need a booby scratch to get the shaitan out. So never hurt the patient. Okay? A Raqi should not touch a sister. Sisters, if you're going to a Raqi, there's, these two points are related. A Raqi should not be alone with a sister if he's a male. Okay? And a Rocky should never touch a sister, right? Now, sometimes I have heard, uh, you know, a Rocky might touch a sister with a glove or, you know, with a cloth, okay? That's different. It's not needed. You don't need to touch them at all. But uh, if a Rocky is straight up putting his hand on you, don't go to that person. Do not go to that person. Don't sacrifice your deen for, uh, uh, to, to think you're, you know, uh, to think this Rocky is going to somehow benefit you, okay? Because they cannot benefit you except by the will of Allah. Uh, blow on the patient yourself while reading. So there are different ways to blow, but basically it's not like a very wet blow where the saliva is like, like it's like you know, it's not like you're soaking somebody with saliva, right? It, it's it's a light blow, and there's different narrations regarding this. Uh, one of them is without without or without basically, um, I guess you could say the moisture. One of them is with a medium level of moisture, and one of them is with more moisture. Now all three are from the Sunnah, so you can do that. Um, uh, blow on blow on the patient or yourself while reading. So, for example, you might read, okay? You might read, and then, for example, after reading, "A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim," "Ghayr Al Maghdubi Alaihim Wal Adzalim," and then you might go onto the and you blow onto them, and and you will see the effect that it has on the person, okay? And obviously, this is. If you're sick and you have COVID, don't be blowing on people, obviously, right? Um, but for a, a healthy Rocky, right, uh, do that as much as you can. Now, if uh, you don't want to, also a male Rocky shouldn't be getting too close to a sister, obviously, right? But um, you can do it, for example, if the sister's lying down and she has her husband there and the Rocky's standing, he just blows while standing. You don't have to be that close, okay? <clears throat> also doing it on water and or ol olive oil. So uh, the best is to do all three, right? While you're reading on a person. So for example, you're reading, uh, you're doing rukia on someone, you blow on them, you have a cup of water and some olive oil beside you, you blow on the water and you blow on the olive oil. So, okay? And you can blow after every surah, after every verse, um, do what's easy for you, okay? Um, and then with the olive oil, the person rubs it on their body. And with the water, the person takes a shower with it, okay? Now, the question of can you uh, now water that has been recited upon and you take a shower in the bath, can you let that water go down the drain? This is also one where there's difference of opinions. Um, I've, heard, I've heard two different opinions. One of them is saying, no, gather it and throw it out in, in you know, a place where people don't walk. Another one is that it is okay. So whichever opinion you go with, uh, it is backed by reputable scholars and Allah has a general best. Now, a note on Tawis. Of course, you can just drink. Oh, after you shower with it? I, I don't know if I would do that for hygienic reasons. I wouldn't, I don't know if I would shower. Um, I, I wouldn't drink the water after you shower with it. Yeah, you can blow and drink and you can blow and shower. Yeah, yeah. Both you should do both actually. Drink, uh, drink it and shower yourself with it. Now, a note on Tawis. Now. Sometimes you go to Rockies or so-called Rockies and they give you things to wear like an amulet, a Tawis, okay? Now scholars say, and again, there, this might be a case where you find different opinions, okay? Um, but what I'm about to show you, you won't find different opinion about that, okay? Um, the next slide, I'm gonna show you uh, different pictures of, of real Tawis, okay? Real things that patients have been given and these things have been destroyed 
Okay, these things have been destroyed. So, you know, some people might suffer from wiswas, whispers of the shaitan. So don't think that these things are going to harm you. Inshallah, nothing can harm you except by the will of Allah. These things have been destroyed. So a note on tawis. A tawis, again, we said is like an amulet that somebody wears around their neck uh, or, or somebody does something else with. Okay. So a tawis, generally speaking, uh, let's go with, with the opinion. Scholars say you are allowed to use a tawis, right? Wear a tawis that has Quran. Okay. If it has Quran and only Quran, you're allowed to do that. No problem. Other opinion might say no, you're not. Okay. But uh, let's say you go with the opinion that it's allowed to wear one with Quran. Okay. Even though it's better to, to recite the Quran, to to use it for protection, to blow your uh, to blow on yourself, you know, drink it, etc. That's that's better than wearing it, right? Because from uh, the Sahaba and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't wear Quran around their necks for protection. Okay. Now, what is not allowed? Things like this, okay? Things like this, okay? Again, these are real, these are real things that have been destroyed. Now, I'm gonna start with the left side, okay? I'm gonna start with the left side. You see all these numbers over here, right? You see all these numbers, these patterns, these squares, and yes, it does say, yeah, Allah, and you see something in the middle and a star, okay? This person, this likely, this could have been, this could have been a magic. <coughs> this could have been basically somebody trying to combat magic with magic. Okay. And how do you know that? Because these numbers mean something. And this is a, this is a, again, this is a very detailed and deep field. Okay. And you can actually add up these numbers and depending on the number, you can tell if this magic was done to, uh, to either to separate people or bring them together or to kill someone. Okay depending on the numbers, because magicians use certain numbers, okay? So you'll see this, this is not Quran. This is random numbers. What do these numbers mean? Allah knows best. And you see, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. And you see that these numbers. Now, magicians use numbers to do magic. Magicians use numbers to do magic. Magicians use numbers to do magic. Yes, I repeat things three times sometimes because it's really important. So this is not a taweez that you should be wearing. If you're wearing this, then this could actually be preventing the shifa from coming down upon you. This could be preventing the shifa from coming down upon you from Allah. This middle one right here looks like absolute gibberish. Okay? But it does have a meaning. You see how there's kind of like a star in the middle. Okay? And again, remember I told you a lot of these jinn, they worship stars. And this person, what they were asked to do... <clears throat> This person was asked to basically take these, cut them, put them under their pillow, and do something with them. So you see very, very weird, weird things. Okay? And you see it's not Quran, it's not Sunnah. What is this? And this one right here in the top uh, right, you see Bismillah, and you see that letter, whatever that letter is, is it Ha? And you see Hamza, 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 wa, 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 and then this, this. This is how magicians do magic. And you see these lines and these scribbles. This person was taught, this person was told to, this is Zafron actually, this was written in Zafron. So this person was told to uh, put this in water, dip it in water and then drink this. So you see how this has no basis. This is, what is this? Random letters and saying, yes, it does say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, but you have to be careful because sometimes a Taweez might specifically say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then do shirk in the same Taweez. Like calling upon... Uh, uh, like for example, one of the one of the jinn, they might say yeah yeah iblis or yeah something like that. They might use one of the names of the jinn, right? So you have to be very very careful. And one thing that magicians do, you may not realize. And again, you wouldn't know if you didn't open like for example the left one up. How would you know what it is? Right? How would you know what it is? So, um, magicians, what they do is they use the Quran to do magic. And this is why I say. Magic, magician, like using jinn is a door to shirk and kufr. Using jinn is a door to shirk and kufr. Because one of the ways that magicians do magic is they, for example, they say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, but they change one letter. Right? Or they might intentionally, intentionally, or they change one word and you don't even notice it because it's so small in your taweez. And look at this, like these dots and these lines and these three and these three and then these random letters. Another thing that they do, okay? And Allah says this in the Quran, brothers and sisters. 
Okay? وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ From the evil of the blowers and knots when they blow. One of the things that magicians do to, to do magic, and this was actually done with the hair of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is they get like a hair and they tie it in a knot. And when they're tying it, they recite random things. They, they, they do this, for example. Hoo, 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 and they do that. This is a way that people do magic. So what I'm saying is, my dear brothers and sisters, you have to be extremely careful with who you go to. I don't care if the person's an imam of the masjid. I don't care if they're a maulana. You have to be very, very, very careful. Okay? So we'll move on, inshallah, because I know I'm giving you guys a lot of information and I want to leave things, uh, leave some time for Q&A, inshallah. What do I read slash do? Specifics, okay? Surah Al-Fatiha seven times. Surah Al-Fatiha is another name for it, is Ar-Ruqya, and there is uh, clearly evidence from the Sunnah um, that uh, I don't want to get into it, but it is known as Ar-Ruqya, okay? Surah Al-Akhlas, Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, seven times each. And when you're reciting it, you're reciting it with the intention of doing Ruqya, okay? Verse 102, which is uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ until the, until the end of it. It's a, it's a long verse. Uh, so you can read that. And again, I'm saying seven times. Brothers and sisters, even if you do it once, tw like three times, do it in odd numbers. Um, inshallah, anything is going to benefit you, inshallah. You do anything. You do as much as you can. Allah doesn't burden somebody beyond what they can bear. You do as much as you can. Okay? Ayat al-Kursi, seven times. Last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, seven times. Uh, all of Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, ideally, if you're able to read it, uh, the hadith says, uh, Indeed, shaitan runs away from the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. Shaitan runs away from the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. And in another verse, uh, it says, اقرأوا سورة البقرة فإن أخذها بركة وتركها حسرة ولا يستطيعها البطلة So read Surah Al-Baqarah. For indeed, taking of it means reading it, acting upon it, is a source of blessings. وَتَرْكَهَا حَسَرَةً And leaving it is a source of sorrow. Source of sorrow. وَلَا يَسْتَطِيُوهَا الْبَطَلَةً Right? And, and the magicians, بَطَلَةً here means magicians, as sahara So, uh, and magicians cannot handle Surah Al-Baqarah. They cannot handle it. So read Surah Al-Baqarah if you're able to every three days. If you can do it in one day, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot for a lot of people, to be honest. It's, it takes like an hour and a half to read it, minimum. So if you're doing it, you know, with Tajweed and stuff like that. So uh, uh, do as much as you can, okay? Even if you read it every three days, there's tremendous blessing in that. Yes, they can. Because the hadith says, uh, can two parents complete Surah Al-Baqarah? Yes, you can. Because the hadith says, تُقْرَأُ uh, فِيهِ Surah Al-Baqarah. It's a house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited, right? It, it's, and, and grammatically, تُقْرَأُ is, is majhul, right? It, it's basically a, a passive verse, meaning the doer is unknown. Okay, so it, it says basically who, in a house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. Okay, so yes, recite it, inshallah. Surah Al-Safat. This is something that uh, uh, many Iraqis use. Wasafat, right? First 10 verses, uh, you can read all of it. Um, uh, Surah Al-Safat is one that is used. Um, okay. Uh, can it be read in English if one's parents cannot read Arabic? No. Uh, in that case, play it on a TV or play it on a, a phone. Um, uh, play it, play it. But, uh, but we can't read the Quran in English because it's not really the Quran, it's a translation of the Quran, right? Okay. And then any part of the Quran, okay? As Allah says in the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar Rajeem, Bismillah Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. How Allah says, Min al Qurani. Uh, the, the ayah and meaning means we bring down basically in the Quran is shifa and a mercy for believers. So the Quran and, and min here doesn't mean some parts of the Quran. It means the Quran in general, any part of the Quran is shifa. Any part of the Quran is shifa. And this is beyond the realms of this halakha. But I want to say that, um, yeah, okay. So I want to say that, uh, some people think that you only use Quran for uh, spiritual ailments like evil eye, 
uh, magic and jinn possession. That's not true. That is not true. Quran can even be used to treat cancer. Quran can even be used to treat cancer. Quran can be used for any, any illness, any illness, a broken leg, uh, this and that, anything, uh, diabetes, anything. And some people say, how, Brother Omar, how do you say this? Allah says it's shifa. Does he say there's only shifa for evil eye and that? No. And this is something that people know. I know a Raqi, I know a Raqi who lives in Dubai, uh, who basically, um, uh, he gets flown out to the U.S. sometimes to treat people with cancer. Saratan. Okay, and he and they are cured by the will of Allah. Okay, and at least one case I've heard from, they are cured by the will of Allah because sometimes, brothers and sisters, what he says is, what he mentioned in, in one of his videos is, is sometimes the cause of the cancer can be magic. Sometimes the cause of the cancer can be magic. Okay, now and the Sunnah du'as, there's many that a person can read. Um, uh, for example. Um, Bismillahi arqiki, min kulli shayin yudiki, min sharri kulli nafsin, or Bismillah arqiki, min kulli shayin yudik, min sharri kulli nafsin, or ainin hasidin, Allahu yashfik, Bismillah arqiki, Bismillahi arqiki. Okay? So uh, any dua, and, and you can change the pronoun according to the person, uh, whether they're male or female. Um, but, but essentially, there are a bunch of sunnah duas. Now, you can just look up, you can just, if you have like Islam, um, Islamic Finder or Muslim Pro, I believe they have a section for du'as for when a person's sick. So if you go on them, as long as the du'a is, is authentic, read it. Read it. And you don't even need to use sunnah du'as when you're doing ruqya. You can say anything. Oh Allah, cure this person. Oh Allah. Oh, oh Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. It doesn't have to be a sunnah du'a. Ruqya is not something that's mashru'a. It means it's not something that's legislated. It means you have to do it like this. It's not like salah where you have to pray salah a certain way. Ruqya, you can do it in different ways. Maybe you want to read this part first, read that part later. But Rukia should not contain any for any shirk or kufr, obviously. Okay. Now, um, how to protect yourself? Obviously, do all your obligations for men. Pray your salah and your masjid if you can. Uh, morning and evening athkars, uh, the, the morning and evening remembrances, uh, the three quls especially. And this is, I think, our last slide. Okay. Uh, read kul huwa Allahu ahad, kul a'udhu bi rabbil falak, kul a'udhu kul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. Three times each in the morning, three times each in the evening. I like to do it after Fajr and after Asr so I don't forget. Okay. Uh, maintain Tahara. Uh, don't, don't stay in a state of, you know, like, don't be filthy, obviously. Keep your clothes clean. Uh, as Allah himself says, fahjur, Right? So keep your clothing clean. Um, uh, and so, so obvious things, right? Um, uh, because one of the things, brothers and sisters, one of the ways that magicians uh, get closer to shaitan is by uh, uh, keeping themselves filthy and literally, literally sitting in their own filth, literally. So uh, make sure your tahara is intact. Remembering Allah often. Always remember Allah. And I want to say something very clear. I think I, I mentioned this um, afterwards. Um, when you enter your house, brothers and sisters, and I'm saying a lot of things I'm saying are very important, but all of these things are very important, honestly. When you enter your house, enter with your right foot, say Bismillah. Because if you don't, if you don't, can anybody tell me what happens? If you don't enter with your, if you don't enter while saying Bismillah, what happens to your house? Based off of the Sunnah Hadith, based off of authentic Hadith, what happens? Yes, Shaitan enters with you. Shaitan, not only Shaitan, but he says, come to his homies. We found a place. We found a place to spend the night. Okay. So when you enter, and, and honestly, even when I have guests over, you know what I say? <laughs> even when I have guests over, I say, like, it depends on who, who it is, right? If somebody I'm very close to, I say, say Bismillah when you enter. Okay. So, because I don't want people Shayateen entering my house, to be honest with you. Okay. But I don't want any Shayateen entering my house. So, um, so basically, Enter and say Bismillah. When you eat, also say Bismillah. If you don't say Bismillah when you eat, what happens? Sin, Shaitan. Yes, Shaitan says, oh, now Shaitan says, come, we found a place to eat. So brothers and sisters, remembering Allah is very, very important for protecting yourself and your children. Uh, saying Allahumma zid wa barik. Okay. 
when we see somebody, so how do you protect yourself from the evil eye and protect others? So this is how you protect yourself. And I also want you guys to protect other people because sometimes, sometimes you can actually give somebody else the evil eye without intending to. The evil eye is not something that has to be given intentionally. And the evil eye is not necessarily, and this is a discussion among scholars, um, but one opinion is that it doesn't even have to accompany uh, envy. So what does that mean? So you can actually be amazed by something that somebody has, but not be envious of it. So for example, your friend gets a brand new Tesla and you're like, oh, bro. And you just, you don't mention Allah. You just, you're shocked. You, ca you could have just given them the evil eye right there and the Tesla could be gone in a week. So what do you say? What do you say when you see somebody who has something nice? You say, Allahumma zid wa barik. Some people say, Masha Allah. No, that's not enough. If we're talking about the Sunnah, that's, I don't want to say that's not enough, but that's not what's mentioned in the Sunnah. That's a cultural thing. You say, Masha Allah. Right? Yes, you say, Masha Allah, Tabarak Allah, may Allah bless it. Okay? As Allah willed, may Allah bless it. But even better, brothers and sisters, make dua for that person. I teach my kids all the time to do this. Kids I know and don't know. To be honest, if I'm visiting a school and I see a kid telling me, for example, Brother Omar, you're like, you're tall. I say, what do you say? I stop them. I literally stop them in the hallway. And I say, what do you say? And I try, and I try not in a harsh way, but I try to say, I was like, I still want my legs to work. You know, like, what do I say? Uh, uh, what do we say? And then I tell them to say, oh, make dua for me. Allahumma zid wa barik. Oh Allah, increase this person or increase the thing and bless it. Okay, very important, brothers and sisters. You see, your friend just got a new house. Your friend just um, got married. Your friend, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, they got a nice car. Allahumma zid wa barik. Allahumma zid wa barik. You don't want to be the reason why somebody else gets the evil eye. You don't want to be the reason why somebody else gets the evil eye. And jealousy is something that is like a disease. It's literally a disease. So may Allah protect us from this disease. Allahumma amin. Reading on your children. Uh, read the three clothes on your children. Uh, uh, again, Surah Al-Baqarah, if you read that, inshallah, your house is protected and your children as well. Um, uh, what I like to read is uh, on my children is the dua uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recite on uh, Hassan al Hussein. He used to say, Uaidukuma bi kalimati lahi tamma min kulli shaytanin wa hamma wa min kulli aynin nama. I seek, uh, um, I, I protect both of you. I seek Allah's protection for both of you. Min kulli shaytanin wa hamma. From every shaytan and ham, um, I don't know how you would how you translate that. Woman kulli ain in lama, and from every ain. So you see, ain is mentioned, ain, right? Woman kulli ain in lama. So you'll see how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to seek the protection, or used to seek the protection of Allah for his grandchildren. So we should also be seeking the protection of Allah for our children and our grandchildren. Reading Surah Al-Baqarah in the home, as we have said, and entering with the right foot, saying Bismillah, and saying Bismillah before eating, as we have mentioned. Okay, I know I've said a lot there. Any questions? I'm going to go back to the top, and I'm going to address these, inshallah. So, um, and then I'll open it up to any mic questions. Um, okay. Excuse me. Assalamu alaikum. Sorry, I just want to, just, can you just, uh, last, uh, last, I want to take pictures, uh, last uh, page. Yes, the, can you just let us have a look at the last slide? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Jazakallah khairan. No problem. I'll go back and I'll, I'll just let me see if I can. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to answer the questions and you can just take a picture. Okay. Um Okay. There's a lot of questions. And I'm telling you this this topic I think needs to be discussed regularly uh, because people are affected. Okay, I have three questions and I hope it doesn't come as offensive. No problem. Um, if magic exists, it would have the potential to destroy nations. Why is it that celebrities and political figures haven't been affected since they surely must be prone to it? My question to you uh, uh, is how do you know that celebrities and political figures haven't been um, uh, affected by it? <clears throat> and I'm not, I know you don't have to answer, but the reality is, and this is something that I've heard, I've, I've heard of more than once. People in the music industry, they use jinn. I've heard this more than once. People in the music industry use jinn. And we know that, you know, this is some, we know that the, the, the music is a tool of shaitan. So to say that they're not affected by it, 
right? To say that they're not, uh, uh, you know, to say that, you know, that, that's not necessarily true. And the other thing we have to realize is that magic can only cause harm by the will of Allah. Magic can only cause harm by the will of Allah. These people, you know, do these people believe in magic? Many of them do, right? I mean, what is a gypsy, a gypsy historic? I mean, gypsy historically refers to a specific ethnic group, but people associated with witchcraft. And we know in many, in all over Europe, witchcraft, witches were literally burned <laughs> on the stakes. So um, uh, people believe in magic, uh, not just Muslims, people of other faith. Um, and so to say that it doesn't affect them, I just, or they're not somehow related to, you know, affected by jinn, I just don't think it's accurate. Um, so we need to uh, first assess if, if that if that is actually the case. Number two, can magic be done to affect one's faith or lead one to disbelief? Um, not, can it be, well, okay. Can magic, can, can it change your heart to kufr, right? Only by the will of Allah. Only by the will of Allah. But usually magic, I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to tell you guys three cases I've heard of magic being done for three things. Either to separate a husband, separate family, separate people amongst each other, separate people, okay? Or to bring people together. I've literally heard a, a, one case of a divorced woman going to a magician uh, to do magic to have uh, her husband and her son back, okay? And this is obviously something major, major sin. And if I told you what she had to do, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Uh, and the last one is to kill someone. So, um, of course, these things that by going through them, they could have an impact on your faith. Um, but um, can it lead somebody to disbelief? Yeah, I can. Um, because, uh, again, the magic could be a test. And if the person fails the test, then, then, then they failed. But so is sickness, so is other things, right? So Allah says, We will certainly test you with different things. Last question is, if someone dies while being afflicted with magic, will they be held accountable in a different way since the magic may have affected their agency? That really depends. Um, a lot of people who are afflicted by magic, they still have control over many aspects of their life. And even people who are afflicted with jinn, they may also still have aspects over, they may also still have control over their life. Um, it really, um, now, and, and like, so there are different levels of jinn possession, right? Some of them are more severe than others. Um, and, and sometimes, so what I'm trying to say is, obviously, if a person has completely lost sanity, then no, they're not accountable for that, right? Um, if somebody is still in their sanity, because here's the thing. Sometimes a person is affected by jinn, but they still know what's going on, but they don't have control over their body or their tongue or anything. So that also, also happens. Um, and again, Allah doesn't burden somebody beyond what they can bear. So not, Allah doesn't punish you for something that's completely out of your, out of your control. Okay, but the reality is for many of these cases, these people still do have control to some extent. It, it may differ depending on the case, but they still do. Um, how do we know if the child is possessed with jinn or magic? Read Quran on them. If, uh, it depends on what age. It depends on what age they are. Um, it's, it's tough to diagnose children because, you know, they, like, I don't know, like sometimes when I want to read on my daughter, she doesn't even, let, I can't even, I can't even keep her still enough to read like the three codes, right? So I read them on myself and then I read the dua at least on her. And so, um, you know, it, it's very hard to diagnose children because they react to things differently. Okay. So just do what you can to protect yourself. And um, uh, yeah. And so, and again, but sometimes, sometimes if a case is extreme, like a child is like screaming every night uh, and it depends on their age too. But if they're screaming every night at a certain time of the night, or around sunset, they start acting. And I say sunset because that's the time when the Prophet Sallallahu told us to keep our kids inside, right? And we know that jinn are active around this time. And I also, when the sun is rising, jinn are also active around this time. So if there's, if there's, if their behavior is very odd and it's associated with particular times, then I would say you should speak to someone. How do we cure it? We mentioned how to cure it. How do we, uh, how does one understand that in an autistic child? Again, it depends on the child. Right, autism is is a is a it's a, it's a you know it's a it's a condition, um, and can it be cured by by ruqya? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Right, it is shifa. Right, at least we could say that it is, of course it is shifa. So, um, uh, people people don't use the Quran in that sense. So, I would say try your best uh, uh, to to read to read on your autistic child. Right, and subhanallah, autism does does affect a large portion of the Muslim community, and I say that as a teacher. 
And this is one of the things that uh, we need to improve on in our Muslim schools. We need to give autistic children support, but we can't even take them in right now, subhanAllah. Um, could you touch upon what was and its relationship, if any, to psych uh, psychiatric diagnosis? Okay, <clears throat> sometimes, what I said is sometimes, um, sometimes a person could be su suffering from bipolar disorder or from um, uh, schizophrenia uh, or from something like that. And, and it could be, the, the cause of it could be gin. The cause of it could be gin. So I'll give you guys an example. This happened in public. And, and, and this happened in public while we were giving dawah. A sister came up and um, she, there's something, so she has taken a shahada, but there's something odd, like just odd about the sister. Okay, I don't want to fall into ghibah. Uh, backbiting, a'udhu billah. So there was something odd about the sister and it's almost like you sense that there's two things inside of her, okay? Like, and she just switches, like she switches. So you know what? I said, you know what? I want to try and read some Quran to see if she actually is affected by something. I said, sister, let me just read something, right? And maybe you'll like listening to it. And she's like, okay. <clears throat> so I started reciting Surah Al-Baqarah and then I started reciting Surah Al-Maryam. And she, she had a reaction and she literally, it, it's almost like she went into Rukua and she was exhaling something very, it was like she was exhaling. So she was going like this. She did this in front of us. Okay. And then she, it's almost like she snapped back into her senses, but then she went on and then, you know, her situation continued from, from what I saw. So person suffering needs multiple sessions, right? I, I, of course, Allah can cure the person in one session if he will, but sometimes um, the case can be severe and the person needs multiple sessions. Uh, and they need a, they need a, 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 you know, a stringent program. So I hope that touches upon the question. Um, how much Quran do we read to them? And if they cry, do we stop or continue reading? Um, you read, you read, basically you read what you can. You read until the person's cured. Now, of course, you can't always do that. Um, but uh, try to read. I mean, I would say at least at, starting out, right? When you're trying to see the person's situation, you read on them. Start with, for example, 15 minutes see how they react, then continue, see how they react. If they start to cry, um, I would say continue reading. Why? Because sometimes it's not them crying. It could be the shaitan crying. It could be the shaitan crying, right? And, and you'll notice because the person is acting differently. It's not their typical cry. It, it, they would cry differently. So if they cry, do we stop or continue reading? Continue reading. <clears throat> Can we have a recording? Yes, uh, so I answered that. Uh, what do we mean by uh, no magic where it is? So <clears throat> sometimes you might know where the magic is. Um, now, what does that mean? So, so basically, if, if you know somebody, okay, sometimes somebody you know might know who actually did the magic on you, okay? So, and they might say, you know what? I, I, I've noticed your case has gone a lot worse. I think I know who did this to you. And then, so the person might know who did the magic or where the magic is. Um, and in this case, you know, uh, the magic should be destroyed. The person should first be spoken to, if that can be done, um, who did the magic. And then um, if, if, if not, then, then uh, the magic has to be destroyed, if you know where it is. And if you don't know where it is, then uh, you have to do Rukia. Okay? Okay, where was I? I don't want to... Okay. Okay, so... Uh, let's see now. Okay, uh, and uh, Brother Adnan's uh, question I think I answered earlier, isn't magic always associated with jinn? Uh, so to answer the question, yes, uh, magic is done with jinn. Um, the magician uses jinn to do the magic. Um, however, what I meant was sometimes the jinn is not always apparent. So sometimes the husband and wife may not go onto each other. Just one second. So sometimes the husband and wife may not actually go onto one, one, uh, you know, each other, but... Um, there's no obvious gin. There's no uh, gin in either of them, is what I'm trying to say, okay? Um, is it okay to do Rukia treatment before one sees a doctor because some diagnoses look alike and person may misdiagnose and give a lot of medication? Yes, you can. Again, Rukia is Quran and Dua. It, there's no harm that's gonna come out of you reading the Quran, okay? So yes, you can do Rukia, um, but just the thing is sometimes you might be doing Rukia thinking that it's gin possession, but the person actually just has schizophrenia, right, for some other reason. Um, but I have heard, like, for example, um, uh, you know, a common thing that's said is that, like, one sheikh was saying, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, he's saying that the majority of those cases are actually gin. 
Okay, so uh, this is a very, very like again, it's a very we could easily split this halakha into two, two different sessions, but um, but yeah, so I, I hope that kind of answers the question. But yes, if you're doing Quranic ruqya, there should be no harm that comes out of that. Okay, how do we select a raqi then? Can you share phone number or details of right one as I need one? Um, very good question. Subhanallah, what can I tell you? <laughs> um, uh, okay, so how do you select the right Rocky? Word of mouth. You have to go to people who have been to Rockies and they'll tell you, well, this guy, this guy just did weird things. This guy I don't trust. This guy's good. Usually the Rockies are well known. To be honest with you, do I know of a Rocky here in BC that I would recommend? Um, somebody who's a full-time Rocky, you know. What I would recommend if you are struggling with this, uh, go see a local imam. Go see a local imam of any of the, of the local masajids, and they can, inshallah, perhaps give you better guidance regarding that. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I answered that one. Uh, storybooks with cover, uh, Allah knows best. I, I don't know. Um, can we, okay, so that one I answered. Can two parents, that one, that one was answered. Uh, and again, can it be, can Surah Al-Baqarah be read in English? Uh, no. If you cannot read Arabic, <clears throat> I would say learn, uh, you know, for your own benefit. But um, uh, play Quran in the house. Play, play in the house on your phone or TV. Um, some Rukia I found online or collection of random dua is also recommended to these listening to these Rukia containing some dua. Yes, you can. You can read the uh, you can read the Rukia containing dua. Um, uh, however, based off what my teacher said is that he's tried everything, and he said that the the most effective and the thing that results in the quickest healing by the will of Allah is the Quran. So yes, you should be still be doing some some rukyas, For example, you listen to them; they're like uh, only dua, which is which is fine. But um, uh, according to my teacher, he said that you know um, the the most effective is the Quran. Does reading the Quran provide shifa or listening to it? Um, okay. Also, if you read it in Arabic and don't understand, will it provide shifa? Yes. You don't have to understand it. The Quran is shifa. Okay. <clears throat> um, and does reading the Quran provide shifa or listening to it? Uh, both are a means of shifa. Again, if you read it, if, if you're able to read, then you read. But sometimes people are so sick that they cannot read. So um, in that case, they would listen. Ideally, okay, so a person reciting ruqya over you is going to be a, a person who's doing it the right way. Inshallah, it's going to be better than listening to an audio. Okay. But sometimes people don't have anybody to read over them so they can listen to audio. There's no harm in that. And inshallah, they'll still find benefit in it. Okay. Uh, can someone give evil eye to themselves? I have heard. Yes, you can. Right. And one of the things that I learned that, uh, that should be said, especially uh, it's mentioned in the Quran. If, you, For example, you look, if somebody looks at uh, their car and they're like, mashallah, I have a really nice car. You say, mashallah, la quwwata illa billah. As what's mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf. Right. Mashallah, as Allah willed, what Allah willed. لا قوة إلا بالله. There is no power except by the will of Allah, except by Allah. So yes, I've heard that people can give evil eye to themselves or even their own children. I have heard that. Can non-Muslims be given ayn or be affected by it too? I mean, can they also give a sign? Yes, uh, it is. It is uh, established that non-Muslims can give a sign. Non-Muslims can give a sign. Uh, can non-Muslims be given ayn or be affected by it too? Um, uh, Allah knows best. I have I have heard uh, of the evil eye. In a general sense, Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Uh, if someone asks for money to perform ruqya on you, are they working for shaitan? Excellent, excellent question. If someone asks for money to perform ruqya on you, are they working for shaitan? No, not necessarily. It is permissible for a raqi to take uh, money from someone. Okay, it is permissible. Um, what is, what's the sad reality, however, is some raqis charge exorbitant amounts. Like we're talking like $500 an hour. Like who are you, Akhi? Who are you? $500 an hour. Doctors and surgeons don't make $500 an hour, right? Uh, yes, you're helping people, may Allah reward you, but $500, who can afford $500 an hour, right? So um, uh, it is permissible to, to uh, take money. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that a person is working for shaitan, but uh, you know, it's... It's a sad reality that, that some Iraqis charge exorbitant amounts, like ridiculous amounts. Um, where can we go if we need help? Um, I would say it depends on where you live. 
I would recommend first reaching out to your local um, Raqi. Uh, sorry, not local Raqi, your local uh, uh, Imam. Okay, especially if you live in the lower mainland. I mean, I, I would I would I would contact Imam Mumla, uh, Sheikh Muad, ask them, ask them for help. Straight up, ask them. Um, and see see where they where they direct you to. Okay. Um, where can we go for help with evil eye if it has affected child to the point of child is hurtful to parents and committing shirk? Okay, that's a very tough one. Um, it, it depends on the age of the child. Um, yeah, so it depends on the age of the child. And again, sometimes people might think it's evil eye, but it's not evil eye. Like, so it, it's, again, sometimes people might think it's evil eye, but it's not evil eye. So, and sometimes it is evil eye. So um, it depends on the child's age. Um, uh, what, what I would say, my dear brothers and sisters, do everything you can to make your house a place of barakah. So if people are saying, I always fight with my wife, I, uh, my kids are always screaming and yelling and there's no peace in the house and it's like people are crazy here. Look at your situation, look at your house. Number one, and I'll be gonna be straight up. Is your house purchased on riba? Is your house purchased on interest? If it is, then I'm gonna ask you, how can you expect Allah to put barakah in something that's haram? How can you make dua to Allah? Oh Allah, bless my house, bless my family. How are you going to expect that if, if, you're, if you're living is haram? So number one, are you living on riba? Number two, do you have images in your house? Okay. Number three, do you have a dog in your house? Okay. And if the answer to all this, well, first you got to start with that. Okay. Um, because you want to make sure that your house is a source of, of peace. And also number four, you should be praying some salat in the masjid. Sorry, in your house. For men, it's the, 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 the sunnah is to pray the farid in the masjid and to pray the sunnah at home. You know, most of our brothers and sisters we see here, they pray the sunnah in the masjid. And, and sometimes it makes sense because it's, it's far away from home or by the time you get home, you could lose your wudu, like all, all these things. Um, but if you're able to pray some of your sunnahs at home, pray some of your sunnahs at home. Uh, somebody asked me, can I see your question? Yes, I can see your question. Um, so that's what I would say first and foremost. Uh, child doesn't want to listen to Quran and stays in bathroom. That's uh, that's a that's a very that's a sign. So spending a lot of time in the bathroom is a sign of jinn possession. Spending a lot of time in the bathroom is a sign of jinn possession. Why? Because shaitan, shayatin, they like filth, and if a shaitan is living in someone, um, uh, they may want to spend that time. They they may want to spend the time in the washroom. Okay. Um, so uh, in this case, in this case. Um, it depends. It depends on the, the situation. Again, the, the Iraqi would determine based off understanding the age, the situation, sitting down with the family. They'll determine what to do. Um, but a person like this who who leaves, uh, they can't stand listening to the Quran. They spend uh, a lot of time in the washroom. This person may need to be uh, sat down and read upon. Okay, they need to. They might need to be sat down and read upon. Okay, um, my, my child is teen, used to read daily Quran, now doesn't. Again, I, I, I could tell you, uh, brother slash sister, as a high school teacher, uh, teenagers, are, <laughs> teenagers are a different type of, <laughs> they have their challenges. So it's not, uh, it's not unusual for a teenager to not you know, want to uh, sit down and read the Quran, read their Quran. So uh, it, it's, it's quite common. But if they're spending a lot of time in the washroom, uh, and, and reacting negatively to the Quran, then that's a, that's a big question, okay? Uh, can someone do ruqya before they see doctor? Yes, yes, they can. Because again, if a person's reading Quran, they're, they're do, reading the sunnah, uh, there's no harm in that, right? The Quran doesn't bring harm, it only brings uh, benefit, okay? Uh, if someone gave evil eye to themselves, do they cure with their own wudu or just a ruqya on themselves? Start with your own wudu, if you think you gave it to yourself. And then, uh, and then see what happens. And then, um, and then if you need to, do ruqya on yourself. Uh, these days we have home loans from banks uh, uh, and will that affect the, ba the balance of Muslim home too? It may. I mean, the hadith says, for example, that uh, you know, a, a person makes dua to Allah and his clothing is haram, right? His food is haram, right? And Allah, and you know, so then how is, you know, not how, but Allah can answer them if they will. But the question is like, you know, and then, he expects Allah to answer this person's dua. So, I don't know. For me, brothers and sisters, I've always tried my best to avoid this. You know, purchasing a home on riba is not a light matter. It's the biggest financial investment in your life. And if you're doing something where Allah, that Allah associates with waging a war with Allah and his messenger, 
Like it's a very serious thing. So people want a happy home, but then, you know, perhaps they, they, you know, they have images in their house and music is playing in the house and, and they have a dog and their house is on riba. Like, like, what do you expect? Right. Of course, Allah, you know, what do you expect? <laughs> that, that's, that's what I would say. Um, and, and we have to be honest. Like, I don't know why people are so like, we have to be honest and talk about these things. Right. I don't know why this is such a taboo topic talking about buying homes on interest. Like it shouldn't be. This should be a, a regularly should be a regular halakha in the masjids. Um, OK. Uh, can you please go to uh, the page where a list of readings were? I want to, I'll tell you what, I'm going to leave my email, brothers and sisters, I, and I'll share this uh, slide or at least a version of it. I'll share the presentation with anybody who wants it. So I'm going to leave my email. I'll do it now so I don't forget. Um, just send me an email, please, and I can send you the uh, the slide, or at least a version of the slide. While I'm doing. Okay. So, where are we? Um, okay. How do we deal with an adult child who is not feeling well, but not listening to durokia or go to the doctor? That's a very tough situation. That's a very tough situation. Um, because sometimes the person themselves, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to be better. It's a very tough situation. Um, and, and, but, but it depends also, what do you mean by, uh, what do you mean by not feeling well? Um, yeah, it really depends on what do you mean by not feeling well? So yeah, you'd have to, again, feel free to send me an email if you want a more detailed. Oh yes, and hijama, yes, hijama can help with all, the hadith says, Khayru hijama. The best thing by which you seek cure with or cure yourselves with is hijama. So do hijama. For any of these conditions, do hijama. Go and get hijama done. And I can also recommend uh, in Surrey, there's a Al Hijama Center of Canada, Brother Ghalib and his wife, Allahumma Zid wa Barik. I actually learned under Brother Ghalib. So I would highly recommend them. Highly recommend them. Uh, and again, if anybody wants their contact, please email me. But if you just look up hijama in Surrey, uh, there's Brother Ghalib. And his wife who do it, and there it's called the Al Hijama Health Center of Canada or something like that. Um, now, yes. So again, if you want to give more details, you can you can email me, and I could try to maybe give you a better answer. Uh, the question is, how do we buy a house? Uh, my question is, why do we need to buy a house? <laughs> and I don't want to be rude, brother or sister, but um, in Islam, it is not a necessity to buy or own. Okay, in Islam, is not a necessity to own your own house. It is only a necessity, it's only a darura to live in a house. So you do not need to buy a house. Like, alhamdulillah, I'm very proud of the fact I've been here my whole life. I, I once almost thought about getting into the market because I, I thought I found a halal mortgage, turned out to not be halal, um, as is often the case. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, it's not a necessity to, to buy a house. It's only a necessity to live in a house. Well, brother, you're gonna be paying somebody else's mortgage. Who cares? Do we care about paying someone else's mortgage? Do we care about Allah first and foremost? So, uh, so brothers, sisters, ittaqullah, fear Allah Azza wa Jal. I recently, I heard of somebody who was in this country for five years and now they own their own house. Like, akhi, people are here for 30 years and they don't own their own house. And you're here for five years and now you have your own house in the haram way. Like, and again, sometimes it is permissible, right? And an example would be, for example, if you have eight kids, you can't rent anywhere, right? And I don't want to turn this halakha into halakha about mortgages, but I'll just mention this. Um, uh, sometimes a person has eight kids. They cannot rent. They cannot rent. They have nowhere else to go, right? Then, then they would consult a scholar, and the scholar may, may say, yes, in your case, because you have nowhere else to go, you buy a house, but you only buy what you need. You don't go and buy a house with two basement suites, and now you're renting out the basement. No, that's haram. You're going be above and beyond what you need. So... Uh, so this is just the reality, brother. Um, do you yourself do ruqya, ruqya to Muslims? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I, I can say, uh, do I do, as in, do you mean, yeah. So I don't have a ruqya service. Let me clarify that. I don't have a ruqya service. Um, I, I do strongly believe that we need a ruqya in our community. Um, uh, subhanallah. But, but yeah, with my schedule right now, I'm just not able to do ruqya on people. Um, if you guys send me an email, perhaps I can give you some advice, some nasiha. But uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just not able to honestly with my schedule right now. Uh, can hijama help with evil eye? Yes, by the will of Allah. Yes. Um, 
where were you? I know a sister who does hijama. If anybody wants her contact, okay, Jazakallah Khair. Uh, so you sort of are hijama with hijama nation. Jazakumullah khair. Um, okay, sorry. Can someone do magic using the picture and voice of the patient? This is a long-term relationship and the guy does history of, sorry, this is a long-term relationship and the guy does history of doing black magic to people, things he can't get. The girl rejected him and, and became sick uh, shortly. Uh, can someone do magic using the picture? Okay. Um, somebody can do magic. So, Usually magicians, when they do magic, they request something. They request something of the people that they want to do magic on. So oftentimes that's something like a hair. They request their hair. They request maybe a picture. Uh, they request um, uh, another common one is like clothing, clothing, um, uh, blood. Uh, and again, like, I, again, brothers and sisters, some of the things that people do to, to perform magic is absolutely low. It's absolutely low. And um, may Allah protect us. Allahumma amin. Um, uh, the voice of the pay, I don't know about the voice, but uh, they, the, the person might ask for the mother's maiden name, right? They might ask, okay, well, what's the, what's the, what's the mother's last name, right? Uh, and a person who asks for the mother's maiden name, I would say, don't go to them. Anybody who asks you, uh, what's your mother's maiden name? Do not go to them. That would be my advice. Um, so can it be done with just the picture, not necessarily a physical object? Um, Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Um, uh, I think from what I understand, the jinn, when they, they ask for the mother's maiden name to identify the person uh, in their world. Uh, and the reason I heard, I heard this, um, the reason I heard for this is because, you know, Allah says in the Quran, that call them by the, their father's name. So the jinn do the opposite of that. So they use their mother's name. Allah knows best that that's true. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I don't know if it can be done just with a, a picture. I, I don't know. And I wouldn't advise that you ask a magician. <laughs> I would not advise you to ask a magician. Okay. Um, now, that was all our written questions. Does anybody have any uh, other questions? I know we've been a while. And, I, and I, again, brothers and sisters, this is a very important topic. Uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to just unmute themselves and ask about? Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, what happened if you don't know who did an evil eye to you? Excellent question. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaha. Allah doesn't burden somebody except with that. Allah doesn't burden somebody beyond what they can bear. You don't know who did the evil eye, right? You're not going to go and ask every Muslim in Syria. That's just not going to happen. You'd spend your whole life doing that. Um, so what you do in this case is ruqya. You just start with ruqya. So, uh, so yeah, you just read, read the things that we mentioned. Uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, you do what you can. You do ruqya. Okay. Now, we did get some written questions. If, and again, if anybody else has any, you want to unmute yourself, go ahead, and I'll come back to the written questions. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As a parent, it's really difficult if the uh, children is adult and they are sick and you can see that they are sick, but then like mm -hmm. they don't listen to you or read Quran. Yeah. And sometimes imams or people are not even available because if you want to try to take but this person one time uh, the child listen to you and you take to the masjid and maybe the imam is not available and uh, you can't read Quran by yourself all the time because he's not going to even listen to you or he will disturb you or he will yeah. make you angry. Yeah. That's it's a tough situation, hard. sister. When you have adults, when you have an adult child, like, uh, you know what, you have to, like, at that point, they're responsible. Right. Uh, and it depends on what you mean. Like if we're talking to somebody who's 20 something years old, even 18, 19, like they're, they're responsible for themselves at that point. Islamically, they're responsible. So if they themselves realize there's a problem and they don't want to do anything about it, that's that's something that's very serious. As a parent, you can advise them. You can do what you can. Uh, the one thing I would say, sister, don't stop making dua. Do not stop making dua, especially during the Hajj time. Um, it's like the same case of somebody, for example, who has a child who left Islam. 
this happens. What do you do? You're going to tell them to come and sit down. I'm going to read Quran on you. I'm going to give you a halakha. Like, like they're an adult. Like, you know, they, they're not, they may not listen to you. So you keep making dua. You keep making dua. You keep making dua. And, and Allah, you know, Allah is the changer of hearts. So um, just, uh, just keep making dua. That's what I would say. Uh, but if they're younger and you have more control over them, then yes, you have to do what you can to get them to sit with a, with a scholar, uh, uh, an imam, or yourself. If you can read the Quran, read it on them. Right, use it. Say, you know what? I'm not giving you your PlayStation or your phone until you come and sit one until you sit with me. And if if they're affected, if they're affected, um, you'll see it. If they're affected by jinn and you read Quran on them, you will you will see it. You'll see the reaction. So you know, by the will of Allah. So um, we ask Allah to protect our children always. Allahumma amin. Uh, but mm -hmm. I'm telling you, we need it. We need we need we do need this in our community. We definitely need people who do rokia properly in our community. Yeah, go ahead, brother or sister. Sorry. Um, I have another question. If can we tell whether we been possessed by jinn or evil eye? Can we sense it ourselves? Can you sense it? Um yes, you okay. So jinn, jinn, yes. If somebody has a jinn inside of them, depending on now, depending on the severity of the possession, yes, because sometimes uh, the jinn might literally completely take over your body, and uh, they might speak. Uh, they might speak on your tongue, and what I mean by that, what I mean by that is they're speaking, and uh, and you you know what's going on. You may you may be aware, but you have no control. It's like sleep paralysis. So somebody is like they they're awake, but they cannot move. So uh, in this case, uh, yes, basically um, you would know. Sometimes it's a, a jinn might live inside you and you may not necessarily always know. Um, but, but usually I would say in, in more severe cases, you would know. Uh, and if a jinn is living inside you, something's going to be wrong with you, right? Like something's going to be wrong. Like you might have like, uh, you know, twitching. Uh, you might have severe twitching. Um, uh, you, you might, uh, sometimes what happens in, in women is that the jinn might cause um, miscarriages repeatedly in women. Um, so, uh, so there usually is an effect. There usually it is effect. Sometimes the jinn can be discreet, but then the Quran brings them out. This is why when Rocky, like for example, like my teacher, he sits with someone, he reads the Quran and, and the, the jinn comes out. They can't control it, right? Because the, the, the Quran is so powerful and the jinn hate it that the, that the, the shaitan literally comes out. And then now the, the, shay, the shaitan is in front of the Rocky. And then you can do the Rocky, right? <clears throat> I hope that answers the question. Just if you have another question, go ahead. Well, yeah. I'm going to just answer. There's a couple more that we just got. Um, is this true? If we talk about jinn, we can attract them. Um, I've never heard of that. Um, my advice would not be to just randomly speak about jinn for no reason. Remember, jinn can be righteous and jinn can be wrong. Right? Right? As Surah al Jinn, you know, uh, it's mentioned that some of the jinn are righteous and some of them are not righteous. Right, they have their different ways. They have their different religions, right? There's Christian jinn, Jewish jinn, you know, star worshiping jinn. There's different jinn. Um, I've never heard of that, but I wouldn't talk about jinn unnecessarily because that's just weird. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, how about magicians doing shows for kids, um, brothers and sisters? I know with things like Harry Potter and mag with magicians, I personally would avoid anything that tries to glamorize magic. Um, I would avoid anything that tries to glamorize magic because if we knew how magic is actually done, um, there's nothing uh, glamorous about it. There's nothing glamorous about it. Um, one of the things that one of the things that jinn, I'm going to tell you just so you get a little bit of a glimpse. One of the things a magician does to get the jinn to work for them is they they make a circle. They make a circle in sand, and then they sit in the circle. They sit in the circle and they don't move until they urinate and they, they, they defecate in it, okay? And then they, they sit in that. They sit in their urine defecation in an attempt to call the jinn. This is one of the things that they do. So when we come along and we show kids like Harry Potter and we, and we have magic shows, and these are, not, these are not magic in that sense. These are optical illusions, but in a way, they're kind of glamorizing magic, right? And me personally, I would never take my kid to a magic show, never. And I wouldn't want my kid to watch Harry Potter. 
because um, uh, in these things, in these shows, you might find a lot of things that are actually true with the real world of magic. They, they, they coincide with the real world of magic. Okay. Uh, should, uh, so could I put Quran recitation on at bedtime since I don't know how to read Arabic and I'm single mother convert and he reacts then my son may be affected. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't do it sister, uh, when going to sleep um, unless, unless you know for sure someone's sick um, and then it, it, if you don't have Quran, then they're, they're affected even more. Um, uh, generally speaking, because the Quran says, uh, not the Quran, well, the Quran does say, Allah says in the Quran um, that, uh, that basically is, وَإِذَا أَوْ فَإِذَا وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So Allah says, uh, sorry, فَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا if the Quran is recited, then listen to it and pay attention so that perhaps you may attain mercy of Allah. So generally speaking, the Quran should not be played while people are going to sleep unless somebody is affected for sure. And you know they're affected and, and listening, uh, playing the Quran will limit, uh, will limit the effect that it has on the person at night. Um, uh, if you want to, I would say put it on during the day, sister. Put it on during the day. And yes, there is an opinion that it is permissible for a person to be listening to Quran while doing their work. There is an opinion uh, uh, that is that is there. Uh, if you read the Quran on someone possessed and they start reacting, what do you do? Do you just continue reading the Quran and ignore the reactions? Um, yeah, basically. I mean, you don't want to put yourself in harm's danger, but you know, in harm's way. But uh, yeah, like sometimes you need to continue reading the Quran and the person may react. Sometimes the person reacts violently. Sometimes the person does react violently. Um, and so, uh, so you do need to, um, but at the same time, uh, perhaps that's a good thing because it shows you the shaitan can't handle it. So um, this is why it's good to go to someone with more experience uh, because th they probably would have seen that and they know how to handle it. Um, but, but yeah, if they start reacting, uh, depending on the situation, um, you may want to continue, you may want to stop, right? One thing that I would say though, well, this is one thing I learned is that if somebody starts reacting violently and you, you don't know how to handle it, just write, uh, just read salawat ala nabi. Put your hand on the person's head and say, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyina Muhammad. And you will find, inshallah, the person calms down. The person calms down. Okay? If you try to read Quran over teen son and they become violent, is there any way to help them? The child refuses to go to masjid, sits in car and will become angry and violent, turns on music when you play Quran at home and listens to music to drown out Quran. That, that is something that's very concerning. Um, uh, if, you're, if your son is a teenager and they're acting like that, uh, that is very concerning. And I would say, um, uh, then you need to use the authority you have over them. Maybe they have a phone, maybe they have a PlayStation, maybe they have something. Um, uh, you know, you say, I'm not giving you anything until you sit, you sit here. You don't even have to read the Quran. I'm going to read on you. And any kid who wants their PlayStation, who's, any kid who wants their PlayStation or phone, they're going to they're gonna do that, <laughs> I, I hope. Right? Um, so, so that's what I would say. But if they become violent, they turn on music, um, uh, yeah, and they play music to tune out the Quran, but the violent part is very concerning. Um, uh, and again, that's where you have to use your leverage over the child. And again, do everything else that you can. Take out the images, make sure your, how, your home is, everything is halal. Make sure, you know, like you're eating halal food in the house. You're saying Bismillah when you enter. You're saying Bismillah before eating. Do everything you can. And inshallah, inshallah, things will, uh, inshallah, we hope you, things will get better. Uh, what about if your kids can't sleep through the night and wake up with frequent nightmares and are afraid of going into rooms alone, even in the daytime? Um, that just seems like a typical kid to me. Um, some kids, I myself was quite scared when I was younger. Um, uh, this could be, okay, so the kid could be affected, but it could just be a kid, right? Um, and sometimes the kids just take longer time to actually um, to acclimatize to, uh, to basically the them sleeping alone I, when our daughter when the, you know the first time that we, we moved her out uh it was tough right she, she it wasn't just easy for her but but they get used to it so it really depends on the situation um uh 
but again, if you want to go into more details, feel free to email. Um, how to destroy the magic object that you find? Excellent question. I'm not going to go into that now. I would recommend speaking to a scholar. Um, if you have magic and you found it, I would recommend speaking to a scholar. There are different ways. Um, it may depend on the type of magic that it is. Can a woman read Quran or phone or do zikr when in height? You can definitely do zikr. Can you read Quran? Yes, I have heard the fatwa that you can also read Quran on phone. Yes. Um, you, no, sorry, not necessarily on phone, but you are allowed to read the Quran. And now on the phone, uh, I don't know that, but I know that a woman uh, can listen to Quran, can read Quran. I have heard that opinion when she's on her height. Um, and doing the uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers the question. Okay. I know we've been going on for quite some time, subhanAllah. It's actually been going for two hours. So um, I don't want to make it too long. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm going to just leave my email once more. Uh, if anybody wants the, the PowerPoint, please email me. Uh, again, I think, I mean, maybe we can do another session on this. I don't know what Sister Rashida thinks. Uh, if you're there, Sister, I don't know if you, it seems like there's a lot of questions, a lot of demand about this topic. Um, but, I think we uh, can do a part two, maybe. Yes, yeah. Please. Yeah, if there is, and uh, maybe we can go into more detail regarding uh, certain, uh, maybe we can actually, you know, go over how to actually do a session. Um, uh, and yes, I can email you the record. I mean, what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to post the, uh, uh, the recording on YouTube, and then I can share with you the link. Uh, do I do lectures in BC? Yes, I do. Alhamdulillah, do different uh, halakat, uh, sometimes Jama'a khutbahs here and there. Um, uh, I live out of, I live in Surrey, uh, and I, I, yeah, so it, it depends, but Alhamdulillah, I'm well connected with Ajial. Um, so it, it depends. Um, it depends. Uh, but yeah, maybe, you, I, I don't know if there's an email list, uh, Sister Rashida, if you can maybe, uh, if there's like an email list or, or you know something that they can get connected to where they can stay up to date on any events uh i have a um whatsapp group uh for halakas so um maybe if you can leave uh give me send me your number and i can add you to the group yeah uh, okay um you know what why don't so the brother the the, the people asked about that why don't you just you can email me your um your phone number and I will share it, inshallah. I'll send it to Sister Rashida. Okay. Um, and then another person added, Sister Rashida, if you can add that person as well. Okay. Uh, this is the first time such a... Yeah, uh, honestly, brothers and sisters, this is a very important uh, topic. Um, and it is something that I think needs to be discussed. There should be Jum'ah khutbahs about this. There should be other things. Uh, halakat, there should be seminars. There should be, you know, uh, training. Um, uh, I mean, the fact that, you know, the, my teacher in Dubai said they serve 3,000 people a day. Um, like, it, it's, and of course, Dubai is, you know, it's, it's a Muslim country, but, uh, you know, uh, I think definitely people, people here need help as well. People here need help as well. Uh, and oftentimes, people are not actually affected by anything, but, but oftentimes they are as well. So at least if you have somebody who's there, they can tell, they can give people general guidance, right? Um, Okay, I'll inshallah share that. Uh, I'll actually, you know what? Uh, I think you were the one. Yeah, anyways. Um, okay, I'm going to just send your sister Rashida right now so I don't forget and it's easier for me. Uh, sorry, not sister Rashida. Sister Rashida, okay, right here. Okay, any final questions before we conclude? Just a quick question. How would you destroy a Taweez which has, do you just uh, put it on, you know, in the soil? Excellent. If you were excellent given question. a Taweez by one of the, one of the Malwees, or, how would you destroy that? Excellent question. Uh, Taweez, it depends on uh, what the Taweez is made for. So, so some Taweez, for example, um, for example, a Taweez might, a person might tell you, okay, well, this Taweez, you have to put it in water and then drink it, right? So that kind of taweez, you don't put it in water. That one, you burn it, okay? You burn it. And so that one, when you're burning it, you actually recite the Quran so that you're not affected. So there's different ways. I've seen Rakis do it. One of them is like you have the taweez and you recite the Quran on it, okay? 
Okay, you recite at least Surah Al Falak and you blow on it. Okay, and then if it depends on the type of Taweez that it is, so you're gonna basically do opposite of what the the magician told you to do, or the or the or the Batar Raki, the, the fake Raki. So if the fake Raki tells you uh, put this in water, you're not gonna put it in water. You're gonna burn it. And if the person, if they if if they tell you to burn it, you're gonna put it in in prayed water. You're gonna soak it, dry it, and then burn it. Um, so so that's how actually those Taweez that you saw there. That's how uh, some of them were destroyed. Okay. But just to for protection in the home, you know, yeah. protection for yourself, just to burn it. Oh wait, sorry for the one that's. You know, you just mean? somebody gave you for just to put it in your home for protection. Uh, Is it just Quran? Six. No, it's not. Not Quran, but. Yeah, yeah. So that with, one, if they just keep it for your home. What I would do, what I, what, what, well, in that case, because they didn't specify anything, what I would do is I would pray on water. I would read Ayatul Kursi, the three Quls, blow on the water, put it in the water, let it soak in the water for a half an hour, well, hour, and then take it out, dry it, right? And inshallah, that'll be enough. But just to be sure, just to be on the safe side, I would say go and burn it, uh, burn it after that, dry it and burn it. That's Thank what I would you. say. You're very welcome. Um, May Allah, may Allah grant shifa to all our struggling, uh, you know, mothers, brothers, fathers, sisters, uh, cousins, nephews, all the Muslims. May Allah grant us all shifa. Allahumma shfi mardana wa mardana muslimin ya Rabbil alamin. Okay, jazakum Allah khair, everyone. We'll end it there. I know it's been a long session. And Maghrib, I think, just came in or is about to come in. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. And remember, my email is there. If anybody has any questions or they'd like the presentation, please email me. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Omar, would you yes, be available sir. next Saturday? Because we, Brother Eamon is not doing a halakha next Saturday. Would you want to do it? Or would you have, would you need time for preparation? Um, I mean, five o'clock? Five o'clock next Saturday. Um, let me just... I'm going to just, just look over my schedule and I'll get back to you, inshallah. I'll send okay. you a message, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Sure. Okay, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Okay, inshallah.